No matter how large you are as a car company, you can't do everything yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, so look where do you need to be doing things yourself? Where do you go horizontally integrated? Where do you go vertically integrated? Uh, I think the industry overall is looking right now, part driven by some of the shortages as of recently, mm -hmm. looking more at a vertical integration. So what the audience doesn't know is you and I met uh, kind of near your home in Palo Alto when we were driving the EQS. And I was fascinated that you were based in Silicon Valley. But then I drove the EQS AMG and I met Eugen from Design. Yes. And he's like, well, my boss is, is, is Philip. I'm like, Philip, he's an R&D guy. What does he have to do with design? So what impact do you have on design? Um, if you ask my wife, a very bad one. <laughs> Back to your question about what impact do I have on design? Um, one is the pure organizational aspect uh, that of having the team, the studio run well. Uh, and then we have a partnership with the design team in Germany that provides most of the content direction. Mm -hmm. uh, but there'll be occasionally, and uh, Gordon kind of humors uh, me or is just nice to me when uh, we have a review uh, mm -hmm. in Carlsbad with a team. And I'll be like, I, I kind of don't like that as much. And he'll like, run that line a little different. But they act like they care what I have to say <laughs> uh, on the exterior design, which you know, that really is an art form. Uh, my previous life, I've worked at SAP, enterprise software, mm -hmm. um, different roles there over time. A lot of them also about the user interface. So when it comes to what we're doing inside the car, from a user experience perspective, uh, we're bringing together the engineering teams mm -hmm. as well as the design teams. That's why I take a much more active role. So historically, MBRDNA, as we abbreviated, mm -hmm. Mercedes-Benz Research and Development North America. Sounds has, like a vaccine. <laughs> has been three different companies. A powertrain engineering company, mm -hmm a um, kind of research technology organization mm -hmm. and a design studio. The three of them were brought together, uh, I think first initially, mainly for economies of scale. Mm -hmm. uh, increasingly, we're also putting emphasis on developing specifically for the North American market. Uh, it continues to be our second largest market in the world. So give me uh, like a, a real world example, it could be the EQS. What specifically was a, either a feature or a product that you guys had your total control over? MBUX. Mm -hmm. uh, you're familiar that we first hey revealed exactly Hey Mercedes being a big part of that. That was conceived by the team in Sunnyvale. Mm -hmm. The entire base layer of that UI came from that team. All the visualizations came from that team. Um, working in close collaboration zero layer. Mm -hmm. uh, you've now the AI the QS, driven yeah. uh, on the hyper screen also rolled out incrementally into other vehicles. Uh, there the entire algorithms, the intelligence comes from our team in Sunnyvale. You think of zero layer, it's, it works well with that large 56 inch hyper screen. Mm -hmm. Was that, did the design folks do the actual screen itself and then you guys did the layer underneath it, the actual UX? The original hyperscreen design came about from, actually it was in Europe, a team was just sketching out a very simple dashboard. And, mm -hmm. and Gordon saw that on a sketch. I was like, I want that. Mm -hmm. That was the start of the hyperscreen from a design perspective. And then the engineering side of the house was given the task, make it happen technically. We want this very, very essential mm -hmm. uh, screen. And engineering figured out a way to do that from a hardware perspective. And of course, the moment it was conceived possible that we could do this, the UX guys went to town and said, what would that bring us? Mm -hmm. And uh, if you look at the current version in the EQS, uh, has a lot of similarities what we have in the 223, the S-Class, mm -hmm. or what we call NTG7. I used to work at Apple many years, so you're bringing a lot of desktop, well, I'd say horsepower, 
Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things they were chatting about was uh, some NVIDIA processors and then also this concept of, of adding a, what was it, a game engine into, yep. the, into this new MBOS. Yep. How much of that do you want to keep inside of Mercedes-Benz? No matter how large you are as a car company, you can't do everything yourself. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, look, where do you need to be uh, doing things yourself? Where do you go horizontally integrated? Mm -hmm. Where do you go vertically integrated? Uh, I think the industry overall is looking right now, part driven by some of the shortages as of recently, mm -hmm. looking more at a vertical integration than historically where they're more Tough horizontal. Tough the past two years, absolutely. Exactly, where we're looking more horizontal integration. Uh, and especially for a company like Mercedes, uh, where we say we are about luxury, we are by definition mm. not a mass market manufacturer. We even more so need to look at where do we want to do it ourselves because that is what is required to bring that unique Mercedes feel, whether it's in how you're driving, whether how you're interacting mm. with the UI to our customers versus where do we need to do the partnership just to have the economies of scale. Mm. Let's you and I do a quick SWOT analysis yeah. on this. You know, you're the guy that runs process. It's effectively what you do at Mercedes-Benz, but you happen to have designers that work for you. What are some of the threats and what are some of the positives? Let's start with the threats of bringing in third parties that would have impact on systems on a car like this. Give me like three. Everybody wants the customer data. Look at who owns the data. Where do you position yourself as a company? So who owns the data? So the customer. First and foremost, Mercedes, as a luxury company, mm -hmm. says the customer owns their data. Hold on a minute, let's not drive past this. The customer owns the data that they're whatever creating mm -hmm. in their car, but I'm assuming you guys would own the data that you're getting from the customer. The car is generating a lot of data. That is also being transmitted to us. What of that data is personally identifiable information? Mm -hmm. We are very much on the side of we leave the customer with their own data. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't want to collect all your location information. We, it's fine if we know within you know, 100 mile radius or so where the vehicle is mm -hmm. in order to give you services. We don't need to go beyond that. And that is different from especially some of the tech companies that are very much about using your data than to sell you more and you're paying with your privacy. Back in Mercedes Agé, was there a debate if you don't pay for the service, you are the, the service, effectively? You, Did you they understand that? Ola say we are more like Apple than like Google. But you're saying you've got partners coming in. Apple doesn't have partners. Apple controls everything, with oh. rules with an iron fist. They have certain fixed. But if you look at the Apple ecosystem, mm -hmm. the Apple store, Apple has lots and lots of partners. So if we were to put it on a spectrum, Apple's over here, Microsoft is over here. So more open yeah. systems and completely locked down walled garden. Mm -hmm. Where would you guys see yourself on that spectrum? So one, I think Apple is not completely closed. If you look at their App Store and so on. I'm a five-year alum from Apple. I could tell you otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I have a lot of friends also there. The company within is completely closed. I, I, <laughs> that I, is true. I agree with that. And they got a <laughs> spaceship, a circle that surrounds you. Yes, they do. Right now, yeah. there, there is no getting out once you're there. But I think Apple has done a fantastic job of building an ecosystem with all these other developers and services on their platform. But Apple controls how they work on their platform. Oh, they, they rule with an iron fist. Exactly. And they completely control their user experience and make sure it fits to Apple standards not somebody else's. Mm -hmm. And I think that is where Mercedes, you know, we are luxury, we are about perfection, the best or nothing. Yeah. That is where Mercedes is a lot like Apple. In that we have a culture of, we could probably do it better ourselves than anybody else. It's first about a mindset of how we're integrating pieces. Now, that means we're not going to build everything in there our own, mm -hmm. but we're going to, to your point, need to be able to control every bit in there okay. in order to then 
get that integrated customer experience the first time around, but then also to continue to evolve it. Because today, you don't expect to just buy a car, drive it off the lot, and it remains that car day in, day out, year Depends after on the year. the car, though. Like, in a car like this, yeah, I think people are expecting over-the-air over the updates, but the guy who's buying an AMG Black Series or a GT3 Porsche, no, he doesn't want to change at all. So it's a different audience. He, they don't want the car, the powertrain, the feeling of the car to change. Yeah. But if there is technical progress, I'm pretty sure they would love to have that. There is a new algorithm or so that extends your range. Yeah. Whether that is an AMG or a non-AMG Mercedes, wouldn't you want that delivered to your car? You know what? I think this is the point of the episode where we turn this around to the audience. So this is, being okay. this is your first time on the show, what I do at the end of all the episodes is I always solicit feedback from the audience. And we've covered two very important things here that I want them to give you feedback on so the next time we get together, we can go through the list because you are Love the it. process guy. So I think the first thing is, what would you guys want Mercedes to control in terms of the operating system? And what would you be open to a third party developer controlling? Is that, is that a fair statement? Th that, fair is, that is perfect, okay. uh, especially with your target on the American market. Well, and actually, 50% of my audience is international. So you're going to get a lot of feedback from all over the world. Good. And then I think the second question is, would you be open to over-the-air updates in an AMG Black Series or a Porsche GT3 or like a Corvette Z06? I think that would be, I think I'm more right on that than you are. And I think we're going to learn something from see that. Ads. Yes. Philip, thank, thank you, you so much, much for finally coming it. on the show. It's a little bit behind the scenes. <laughs> I met this guy two years ago, the first time I saw the pre-production prototype S-Class. Like he flew yes. this thing in from Germany. That's, that's the kind of moxie this guy has. <laughs> And we met like under the cover of darkness in the depths of the virus. And he was nice enough to come out and give me a walk around on the car. So thank you exactly. very much for that. It's been a pleasure every time since then. Yeah, thank you. We'll have you on more again. Thank you. Until we guys, until we see you in the next episode, bis später.